I serve as Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusion at Connecticut College. Uh, first of all, congratulations. This is a really important moment in your student and your family's lives. Um, it's a monumental achievement to be admitted to any college, but especially a college as great as Connecticut College. So, uh, hopefully you've had a moment in spite of everything that's happening in the world to really celebrate this important transition that your student is making. Um, as Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusion, my role is pretty uh, multi-purpose, uh, as is implied in the title. I am certainly helping to lead efforts at the college to think about what it means to live and work and study in a diverse and inclusive environment. And of course, I could get into a lot of details about what that looks like, but I'll just say that I work with a team of professional staff and student leaders to try and enrich the experience, not only for students from particular um, racial, ethnic, gender backgrounds, uh, but everyone. Diversity really is about, um, about uh, ensuring that everyone can bring their entire self uh, to the campus environment and enrich not only their own uh, sort of learning experience, but the learning experience of everyone else. So um, I'll just quickly run through the offices that I oversee. Uh, Unity House is our historic multicultural center. It's been around for more than 40 years, um, primarily working with race and ethnicity programming on campus. Uh, we have religious and spiritual programs. We have the Office of Gender and Sexuality programs. We have student accessibility services, as well as sexual assault prevention and education. So it's a really dynamic group of people who work together to provide um, services, to provide education to the campus community. And uh, we wanna make the experience really wonderful for everyone. So I'll stop there for now and be happy to take questions later. Victor, hop on in, man. You're still on mute though. That's a problem. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, That's great why I get invited to these things. It's uh, great to be with you all today. And again, congratulations um, on becoming part of this community. Um, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what it means to be Dean of Students at Connecticut College. Um, I work very closely with um, John McKnight and with Jefferson Singer. Our, our teams are all very much um, connected in providing a robust out of the classroom experience um, you know, for our students in a wide variety of ways. Um, you know, the offices in particular that I focus my attention on um, are residence life, which here we call residential education and living, student engagement and new student programs, counseling services, health services, um, the Office of Health Promotion and Wellbeing, um, the honor code and student conduct, uh, campus safety, and athletics. Um, and a lot of what our work is, is about creating an educational approach outside of the classroom um, that is very much linked and connected to uh, the student academic experience in the classroom. And Jefferson Singer will talk a little bit more in detail about that approach. Um, but I think a couple of things that are really important about you know, the, the, the con experience for students and what we help to facilitate is this notion of, of shared governance, of students really becoming an empowered to become a part of shaping the direction of the community, both short term um, and the long term, and really taking responsibility for um, you know, this place that we call um, that we call home. Um, and then also just providing the space for students to, to, to reflect, think how to get those connections between what they're doing in the class um, and outside the classroom. Um, a lot of what we do too as a division and in connection with John and, and Jefferson's area is to provide a support network for students, um, to be able to provide um, resources for them when they need assistance, and then also for us to be able to identify students who may be struggling. And we have something called the care team here um, where we have uh, members of our three teams working together to connect the dots and help identify students that might be struggling academically, behaviorally, socially, or in some way and then be able to provide the, 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 the support network to be able to be successful. Identify the people who um, can be most effective in supporting um, you know, each, each student. Uh, campus safety is you know, always on campus and always available, um, and they help students get connected to the people who are on call at the college, um, which are members of my staff. A lot of us live on campus, so students you know, see us not only during the workday, but also eating in the dining hall, and just being part of the day-to-day -day life of, um, of the institution. And we can get into more of the details about what we do and how we do it uh, through the questions. So I'll pass it on to, to Jefferson. 
Hello, everyone. So I'm Jefferson Singer, uh, Dean of the College and also a professor of psychology. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about the academic experience for the students that works in close partnership with the uh, Division of uh, Equity and Inclusion and then with student life. So academics at Connecticut College, I'd say, can be best defined by our mission statement, liberal arts in action. And we have a, a curriculum that is oriented to trying to help students to use the liberal arts to think about ways that they can connect this, uh, what they're learning to their interest in careers, to their interest in being involved citizens in, in the community. So there are many ways in which the academic experience is closely allied with the career office, closely allied with leadership experiences, and offers a variety of, of experiences outside the classroom that connect to summer internships, to study away, and to work in the New London community. So in all aspects of the academics, there's a way in which we're looking beyond the campus walls to seeing how students can be involved in meaningful ways in experiences that will prepare them for professional um, lives and graduate school afterwards. Within my particular area, I am involved with overseeing our connections program. So if you have questions tonight about that innovative curriculum, I'd be glad to answer those for you. I also am involved in, as I mentioned, the career office and the academic resource center, which provides all kinds of support for students in time management and writing skills in quantitative skills and uh, oral communication. It's one of the real signature programs of Connecticut College and bringing students the kinds of supports they need to succeed in their academics and also professionally. Uh, I also oversee the study away program, which provides students at usually about 50% of our students in a given year will do some form of study away experience. And they travel to all parts of the world um, uh, and also in some cases will do some form of uh, domestic study uh, as well. Uh, in addition to that, my office oversees fellowships. And so we've had a strong record of being able to be a top producer for Fulbright fellowships and other fellowships, including uh, this year, a National Science Foundation fellowship for one of our graduating seniors. So uh, one of the great things too about my office is that we are very much involved in supporting advising on the campus and the first year seminar, which has a great advising program that involves um, staff and students and faculty and forming a team of advisors for students as they're going through their first year and then supporting them as they eventually choose an academic major. So, but the last thing I'll say is just that I think it's very important to emphasize the connections that I have with the other two gentlemen that are speaking to you tonight. We work closely together. We don't see any walls between the academic world and the community uh, and the campus life. They're integrated with each other. We meet every week, um, more than usually one time a week, to try to make sure that there's a holistic integrated education for our students here. So I'll stop there and we're really open for questions from you. So what we're going to do at this point in time is I'm going to serve as the moderator and we're going to use the chat function to ask questions. And then what I will do is I will forward those questions on to our respective panelists and we'll kind of work that way. So if someone has a question, feel free to type it into the chat box there and I will then farm it out to the three experts who know way more about a lot more things than I do. Uh, at this point in time, my job is to basically just read the question off the chat box to the experts that are currently on your screen. So feel free to fire away folks. Um, this is your opportunity to learn what your you know son and daughter's experience would be like. And these three deans head up um, a multi-division approach to what we call the student experience group, academic, social, um, things of that nature. How is the food on campus? Let's start there. Who wants to tackle that one, guys? I'm also noticing that there's questions just, Andy, under Q&A as well. Yep. yep, I'll get to those in a second. Okay. Uh, the food? Uh, Students love the food. Um, the uh, the dining hall. There's a main dining hall that's in the the Plex, which is one of our larger you know residence halls. And then we have a smaller dining hall that's in the south of of campus. 
um, in J.A. Freeman, uh, and we have a uh, grill um, kind of snack shop in our student center, and then we have um, uh, two student run, actually three student run coffee shops um, on campus. You get coffee uh, just about anywhere. Um, there's lots of offerings of that. And when I say student run, I mean the the students you know run the whole business. They have uh, managers, bakers, baristas. You know they're baking all kinds of um, goodies to go around, uh, go along with the uh, with the coffee. So maybe a question that seems to be popping up at this point in time is contingency planning for the fall. And, and I know we have a number of working groups that are discussing this right now, but maybe it'd be a good idea for us to have a little bit of a broader conversation regarding um, contingency planning for the fall, especially in light of coronavirus and COVID-19. So um, the the president has established three working groups um, that have been actively you know operating and meeting in planning for the fall and 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 the spring for the whole academic year, um, and uh, those three groups are, there's one on the continuity of academic uh, program, one on the continuity of campus life, and the third is the con uh, continuity of business operations, um, and these groups are working um, separately and together. To identify, you know, strategies for, um, you know, for the fall in light of of COVID nineteen, um, and using all the information, not only information that's available to the public, but also um, we are in the process of identifying um, our um, our alumni who are in fields that relate to COVID nineteen to provide essentially an expert panel um, to help provide us with guidance um, and direction uh, as it relates to our. Um, you know, planning moving forward. We are still in the early processes of, of this planning, so we don't have any kind of clear answers as to what, um, you know, what the future plans are, uh, but we are working very closely, again, not only on campus with ex outside experts, and then also in very regular connection and communication with our NESCAC, um, you know, peer institutions. You know, I have a meeting every week with the NESCAC deans. Um, Jefferson is meeting every week with the um, you know, deans and provosts in, on the academic side. Our president is regularly meeting with the NESCAC presidents as well. Um, so we're in regular contact in, you know, exploring the different ways that institutions are thinking about, um, about the fall. Anything else, gentlemen? Well, one of the questions that came up was, could you talk a little bit about the Connections program and maybe provide a real life example? So feel free to fire away. I think Jefferson, we could start with you on that one. You do have a PhD in connections in some respects. Sure, um, to, to try to give you a sense of connections, I think the important place to start is to say that the faculty designed connections in order to answer a need that we see in the world today, which is to help students become the kinds of thinkers and leaders who can do what we call integrative thinking make connections across different areas of information and work collaboratively with other people to solve pretty complicated problems, problems like COVID-19 or, or climate change or uh, refugee crisis, really thorny problems that need um, multiple people and multiple solutions to try to answer them. So Connections is a curriculum that says we need strong academic majors, just like any other college students need to specialize in a particular field of study, take a set of courses in that academic major. But then beyond that, they also need to be able to take the other courses that they've been, um, that they're taking at the college and find connections that help them to understand particular interests or passions that they have. So in addition to a major, students will, in their sophomore year, have the chance to join a center or a pathway and when they join those centers or pathways, they will be with other students from maybe different majors, but focusing around a particular passionate interest that they have. So right now we have pathways and centers that focus on public health. We have pathways and centers that focus on entrepreneurship, on creativity, on peace and conflict. And once a student is part of a pathway or center, they begin to select a set of courses that allow them to pursue an interest within that pathway. And then in their junior year, they do an off-campus experience that also connects to that interest. 
when they come back as seniors, they come back together with the group of students that have been in that center pathway, and they prepare to do a presentation to the community. And just this November, we had our first all college symposium where a close to 200 students presented to the community about um, their particular interest that they had studied in the center or pathway. So to make this very concrete for you, let me tell you about a student who was in the public health pathway. This student happened to be a government major, but uh, he had, his father was a physician, and so he's always had an interest in health and, and medicine. So though he was a government major, he joined the public health pathway and then ended up taking courses both in government and outside of government that helped him to think about health policy. He then did an internship after his junior year for a hospital where he worked not as a physician's assistant or in the medical part, but in the administration of the hospital. And working in that administration, he developed a program with others to do outreach clinics on dentistry for people that were living in areas isolated from the hospital. He came back from the internship, presented on this as a senior, and now he's at Johns Hopkins working in public policy and health policy. So he was a government major, but used the public health pathway to expand and integrate his interests, adding courses and off-campus experience. And we have many other students where we could give you examples of that way where they take their major, but amplify it in a career direction using the Connections program. I, I hope that gives you a sense of it. Great. We also had a question about how strong would you say the community is? How do you see students and teachers supporting each other day to day? Hey, John, why don't you, uh, why don't you tackle that one first? And I know there are some, some global questions about deferrals and the deferment process. Once we get through this community-based question, I'll dive into some deferral, deferral uh, conversation really quick. Yeah, I had a feeling I'd get called on for this. Uh, I have to say it is my favorite thing about the Khan community that we are, in fact, a really engaged, connected, um, really loving community is the word I would use. I've worked in a few other institutions of higher education, and they've all been great. And, you know, they provide great academic uh, opportunities and um, prospects for jobs. And all of that's true about Khan as well. But the thing that sets us apart by far, I would say, is the strength of our community. Um, it kind of flows from what Victor was talking about earlier, the fact that we have a very a strong system of shared governance. We have students, faculty, and staff who work alongside uh, one another in committees and even in informal ways to try to advance um, the mission of the college. And that's something unlike what I've seen in other institutions. That is really powerful. I'll just say two other quick things about it. One is we're not afraid to tackle challenging issues, social issues out in the world or issues that might be affecting uh, some group of people on campus. Um, some campuses shy away from that. We have a very strong um, sort of protocol around freedom of expression. We're committed to having lively, vibrant, um, enriching conversation, even when it's hard. And so we try to teach our students, as well as our faculty and staff, um, that they can and should engage when there are opportunities to do so. One of the really exciting projects that's underway right now is called the Dialogue Project. Um, we had a very generous gift from an alumna of the college to be able to endow a program that essentially allows us to teach courses as well as offer out of the classroom experiences to help students develop the skills that they need to be able to engage in difficult conversations with one another on topics like race and gender and sexuality, or as Jefferson mentioned before, climate change or uh, any number of issues that are there. And I would say that, you know, some campuses shy away from that level of, of conversation because it can be controversial and can be divisive, uh, but we approach it in a way that I'm really proud of. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that there's no better moment than the moment we're living through right now to see the sort of humanity of the Khan community, the way that over the last month or so, the community has come together to support one another through the massive transition of having to move to remote instruction and having to move our employees to remote work. Um, there's been so many, as recently as an hour ago, I've been getting outreach from members of the community asking what more they can be doing to help. Um, can they order supplies for the students who are uh, living on campus and can they, you know, support? Um, you did, Andy, thank you for that. I just bought some shaving cream for all the kids on campus. I feel really good about that. 
Absolutely. Uh, but we're the kind of place where even, you know, people with big titles uh, and, and fancy degrees are, are not too far out of reach. Uh, all three of us, as well as Andy and his team in admissions, are very uh, available to our students um, and to one another as colleagues and faculty on campus as well. So that's really um, one, one thing I would say uh, is we are very, very strong. We're con strong. Victor, what do you got? Something else I just wanted to add, um, you know, having worked at other institutions similar to, to Khan, what I love about this place is that it's a place that students, that everybody cares about each other at a deeper level um, than I've experienced at other, at other places. And I think part of that stems from the fact that there is a sense of, of, of community as a whole. Um, you know, I saw a question kind of scroll before, you know, what's different, how is Khan different than the other NESCACs? And I would say one of the ways that we're just different from some of the other NESCACs and a lot of other peers is that we don't have um, uh, Greek organizations and don't have a history of Greek organizations. They're just, we're never part of this campus. Um, so what that means, having worked at institutions that have very strong Greek organizations, is that the campus doesn't get fragmented. You know, the social experience doesn't get fragmented in the way that I have witnessed at other places. Um, there is a sense of wanting to be part of this this whole community contributing to this whole community um, and supporting each other through, you know, whatever might be going on in people's individual lives, community lives, and you know, different, you know, groups. Um, it's just a very supportive um, and caring kind of a place. Because we've gotten a handful of questions about deferrals, I thought it might be a good idea for me to sort of tackle that. Um, the, the folks on, on this WebEx have heard me use the word unprecedented uh, about a million times since the coronavirus situation really started flaring up here on the East Coast in, in mid-March. And I really believe that unprecedented circumstances at times call for unprecedented actions. And typically we have asked for deferral requests to come in by about June 1st to June 15th. And we review them and then make a decision as they come in. My suspicion is, and I'm not working alone on this, in fact, the folks that you see on the screen are the folks that I plan on having some pretty intentional conversations regarding deferrals, is we are the type of institution that works with individual students and families and meet them where they are. Uh, each family is going to bring a different set of circumstances to the table when it comes to a deferral request, and, and it is our responsibility as an institution to engage in that conversation and respond accordingly. My suspicion is, is that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in terms of what August will look like, um, both nationally, but locally here in the state of Connecticut and on college campuses across the United States. And our commitment as an institution is to make sure that we provide a high quality education, but we do so in a safe and healthy environment for our students, our faculty, our staff, and their family and friends. So as deferral requests come in, I really believe that we're gonna engage with them in, in a very serious way. And we're gonna work with first years to make sure that when they arrive at Con, they arrive at the right time, at the right place for them emotionally, physically, health-wise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that covers that. I, I do want to get to, there was a pretty good question that. Sherry Fisher asks, saying, hi, thanks for being here tonight. A good friend in the talent placement business is saying that folks looking for jobs need certificates today, as well as critical thinking, communication, and interpersonal skills. Can you help students map their con call develop skills to industry known certificate standards? Um, I suspect we should probably start with Jefferson on that one, uh, but if anyone else has anything to add, it out there. Well, I think what the question does is it does give me a, an opportunity to tell you a little bit about our career program and then I can get to the specific question of certificates. But uh, it should be noted that Khan is at this point, to my understanding, one of the only colleges in the country that offers a seven week, four credit career program. So students in their first year are able to take a seven week course either in the first semester or the second semester, or they could do it even in the fall of their sophomore year. And in that seven weeks, they get the opportunity to learn how to explore a variety of different career paths. 
They also learn how to tell their own story and begin to develop a career narrative that they can use in interviews and for internships and, and jobs. They also learn about the qualities of professionalism, how to appear in an interview, how to write a cover letter, how to have an appropriate resume. And they also learn the vital ingredients of networking. So they learn how to use LinkedIn and other social media um, tools to be really effective in the career at work. And I'm telling you, they're doing this in the first year. So on that, they're building by having relationships with career advisors from the first part of the time they're here through all four years. Individual and group sessions with career advisors to give them a leg up on finding the right kinds of internships and opportunities. And then they can earn money um, from the career office to apply towards workshops, job shadowing and internships. And that money is available to them after they've taken the seven week course, they can have access to a $500 um, stipend that can be used for job shadowing or a mini internship or, or coursework. And then they can continue to earn funding all the way up to $3,000 um, to apply towards their career exploration. So it's, it's an extraordinary career program that is now actually housed in a new facility a renovated area of our uh, fanning building on the first floor of that building with uh, state-of-the-art uh, interview uh, pods that allow students to do a remote interviewing and to watch themselves and play back and, and see how they're behaving in interview uh, practice. Uh, regarding the certificates, I'll, I'll just say for that, centers and pathways, um, once you complete a center or pathway, you do in centers earn a certificate and as far as pathways are concerned, it's put on your transcript. So the students do have the credentialing that um, employers might be looking for in fields like um, international studies, arts and technology, environmental studies, and then the variety of pathways I mentioned before, for example, public health or entrepreneurship. So I do think that there are, there's a robust career program that also gives them some tangible results that they can show to employers. We did have a question about counseling, and I think in, in, in regards to stress and anxiety, uh, which I, I, I suspect, trust me, my stress and my anxiety is certainly higher than it normally is, um, especially because it, it's April in admission with coronavirus. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about counseling and therapy and, and, and health on our campuses, as well as our proximity in the I-95 corridor. So, um, so we have counseling and health services right on campus. Um, the building is actually really central to the campus, um, right beside the library. Um, and students, you know, frequent it um, quite a bit. Uh, about 50% of our student body over the course of their four years access counseling services at some point. Um, we have a great staff of folks with a diverse array of areas of expertise um, in the area. Students have the opportunity to, you know, you know, connect with the counselor, and if they prefer to, you know, tr change to a different counselor, they can do that. It's very flexible. Um, we also offer a variety of different kind of therapy groups um, as well to help students not only um, work through things that they might be struggling with, but also have peers that they're able to work with as well. All facilitated by a professional. Um, by a professional counselor, um, and there is no cost to go to, to see a counselor. Um, and then in the same building, we have student health services, um, which, you know, sees students for a variety of the kinds of things that you would go to, a, you know, primary care, um, you know, professional to, um, you know, to go see. Again, students frequent that, you know, facility a good bit. Um, again, they share a space. In that space, there's a sleep pod. There's uh, two massage chairs. Students are in and out of this space all the time, um, you know, just to socialize, to relax, um, but then also obviously to see the professionals. Can I just jump in, Andy? Um, Go ahead, John. It's kind of related. I see a couple of questions about food allergies, which makes me think I can connect to the health and wellness um, and talk a little bit about student accessibility services. Um, if people come in with a documented, documented medical need of any kind, including um, severe food allergies, they would register with the Office of Student Accessibility Services to receive various kinds of accommodations. And those can uh, be in the academic realm, they can be in the dining services realm, they can be in the residential realm as well. So 
We have a, a staff um, that is ready to receive that information from you and your family. They will work with you. As Andy mentioned before, we take a very individualized approach to reviewing um, the, you know, the needs that the students have, uh, and we will do everything within our power to accommodate. Um, obviously, we have a legal obligation to do that, but it's also just the, the con way that even if something uh, doesn't fit, you know, uh, the strictest definition of what is legally mandated, we will, we will try our best to support um, what your students need. Um, I hope that addresses that, that set of questions coming in. Here's, here's a good sort of combination of question. Um, you know, first years in their housing, and then I think we have some questions that would relate to first year orientation specifically. And can you comment on how a student that 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 does not know what major he or she wants to take can get some orientation and support in the first year to explore options and help him or her decide? So I think that would be first year housing into first year orientation new student orientation, and then um, first year advising. I think that's a really good umbrella topic that we could all dive in on. Feel free, guys. All right, so I'll start with, with, with housing. Um, so we have um, different kinds of first year housing. Uh, we have a couple of buildings that are all first years um, together. And then we have um, other buildings that are mixed class housing, but with first year students clustered together in um, you know, large numbers, so they're not just kind of on their on, on their own uh, and both different kinds of um, living arrangements, you know, create a lot of community, uh, you know, a little bit different when you're with all first years versus when you're with upper class students and those upper class students are connecting with student and with first years in new and different ways, kind of connecting them, you know, across across campus. Um, but even the students who are living uh, in all first year housing are also connecting with upper class students through clubs and organizations and the dining hall and classes, et cetera. Um, so, like I was saying before, it's, it's a very connected kind of a campus and folks really care about each other, regardless of what year you are. So it's not, a, you know, very divided in that, um, you know, in, the, in that regard. Um, over the summer, you know, you'll have this, your students will receive a form to fill out with some basic information about Kind of what they're looking for in a roommate and their own kind of you know lifestyle you know living um you know habits and then the residence life you know pairs um students up or connects students up um you know with roommates and then students get that information typically in july um enable them enabling them to have um time to connect with uh their roommates in preparation for you know coming um coming to campus um, every floor has a floor governor um, on other campuses. You might hear them called, um, you know, RAs here. They're called floor governors and every building has what's called a house fellow. A house fellow is kind of like a senior floor governor a person who's been a floor governor before and they help kind of lead the whole building and building community, you know, within the building. Um, none of our buildings are very big. I mean, I mean, the vast majority of our residence halls are roughly about 80 students. Um, so it really allows folks to create a close knit, um, you know, community across, um, across the floors. Um, orientation, um, you know, really starts right away. You know, students will have, um, as soon as a student, you know, deposits and commits to coming to con, will have access to an online, um, experience that will introduce them to Connecticut college with videos, um, and information and, um, a way to start to become acclimated to the college even before you know setting setting foot so that they're all primed and ready to go when um when they arrive for the traditional um orientation period um which usually is about five days and you know provides us with an opportunity to you know help students to get to know each other um and to get to know the college and all the resources that are available here um and become comfortable with with the place before classes start, um, you know, a few days in. Um, and a key part of that orientation period is getting to know your advising team and beginning to work with your advising team. So I'll hand it off to Jefferson to talk a bit about that. Yeah, I, I would say even before we get to the advising team, something that we do at Connecticut College is we have a summer reading program. Mm -hmm. We also have students choose their first year seminar during the summer. They see the list of approximately 30, 35 first year seminars, and they make their, their top three choices. 
and we guarantee them that they can have one of those three choices. So once they choose their first year seminar, their instructor for that course is pre-major advisor, is the person in the faculty that will be their advisor and their teacher for the first year seminar. That also is the person that will discuss with them the summer reading along with two to three student advisors and a staff advisor who is a member of our community as well. In addition to having the uh, instructor, the student advisors and a staff advisor, every first year seminar also has a career advisor. So you have a team of advisors that are there to support you and to answer questions about potential majors and fields of study, what centers or pathways you might wanna join. In addition to all that support and information that students can get, the departments have student advisory boards and often the student advisory boards will run um, information sessions during the fall and spring about what it would be like to major in anthropology or major in psychology. And first year students can come to those forums and learn a little bit more about what the opportunities would be to have a major in that field. So there's just really support from every direction about helping students find a, a way that a path forward that would fit for them and make sense for them. And they're not in a hurry to declare majors. You don't have to declare your major until the spring of your sophomore year. So there's plenty of time to figure that out, to sample and experiment and figure out really what the right course of action is for you. John, you wanna jump in or do you feel like that just hit it on the head? It hit it on the head. I, I will say that I had the pleasure of teaching a first year seminar last year and I'll be doing it again this fall. Um, and, you know, as Victor and Jefferson both uh, alluded to, it's obviously it's a wonderful intellectual exercise, getting students acclimated to college level reading and writing. And, um, you know, they get to choose based on their own interest, um, something that they may already know a little bit about or something they know nothing about. Uh, so that's a fun intellectual exercise uh, from the vantage point of the instructor. But I would I would say what's most unique about it, as they have they as they've said, I'm just really highlighting is the sense of community as to get back to the earlier question about community. It really starts to develop in that first year seminar because of the amount of time that the students spend together with their peers and with their faculty and staff and student advisors. Um, you know, I see our students all the time now walking around. Well, not in this precise moment, but I was seeing them walking around together on campus uh, and they, they forge a really strong personal relationships through that experience. So I think that's an example of how the sort of academic flows into the residential and social experience at Khan in a way that I haven't really seen elsewhere. I just want to jump in and, and add an example to what John is saying. So I was not an instructor for the first year seminar, but for the last two years, I've been a staff advisor where I've been a support to a first year seminar, not teaching it, but just helping with the advising. And something that happened last week is a great example of this. Um, the student was getting ready to pre-register and they had been in the first year seminar that I served as a staff advisor for. And I got a message in an email from the student saying, hey, would you mind if we could have a, a video chat together before pre-registration so I could just run over some things with you and ask some questions. So I'm not the student's um, pre-major advisor. I'm just part of the community. But the student felt comfortable enough with the, the group that we had built together that they could reach out and ask me for some suggestions and, and support. And I think that's what we're trying to cultivate here, a community where there are many different avenues of support available. It doesn't just have to be your advisor. It doesn't just have to be your student uh, advisors. It can be another member of the community that can be helpful to you. Great. Thanks, Jefferson. Uh, we did have a question about, can you explain a bit about the science majors, biology, botany, environmental science, and the resources available? Any examples of internships or research opportunities or specialties of the professors? And I think that could lead into a secondary question we've gotten a little bit about in terms of pre-professional advising, pre-med, pre-law, things of that nature. So Jefferson, that's your wheelhouse. Yes, I, I'm going to talk about this, but I'm going to, after I finish, I'm going to ask Victor to say a little bit about our, how our science faculty are connecting to the Sprout Garden, uh, which is, I think, a wonderful example of Perfect. science connecting to um, liberal arts in action. But our science programs are programs that specialize in trying to bring students into research. And we have the Summer Science Research Institute 
which um, usually has over 100 students involved. And even this summer where we can't have the students there in person, the, it pivoted to allowing for remote science internships. And a number of our students are going to continue to be able to do research activities in computer science and mathematics in fields where it's possible to do remote research. But uh, the, the Science Summer Research Institute funds students and provides them with housing over the summer. Uh, and faculty also have networks of connections with other labs in universities. For example, we have a physics professor who is networked with um, the uh, laser laboratories at MIT and uh, often pl places students there. We have faculty that have expertise in um, biochemistry and luminescence and using um, the natural dyes that organisms generate to track uh, disease and um, other medical conditions using those um, bioluminescent um, capacities. There are also faculty that have expertise in marine biology. We're a coastal school, and so we've been cultivating in recent years faculty that have expertise in um, organisms that live in the shorelines. But I'd like Victor to say a little bit about a very interesting development that's been happening with some of our science faculty as well. Um, sure, so I can talk a little bit about, uh, so in the botany department, we've had um, a faculty member who's gotten very involved with our sprout garden. Our sprout garden is a really expansive garden that's right beside the, the student center um, and working very closely with student leaders and just general students across campus in cultivating this, um, uh, th this garden and connecting that work to the city of New London um, with different resources there and gardens um, in New London. You know, the, the, what's grown in the garden is offered to the campus through the dining hall as well as within the student center. It's all very much connected in terms of what's happening in the classroom with the lived experience you know, on campus um, and then connected to, to the city of New London as well. So I also wanna come back and not neglect um, the pre-professional uh, pre pre health program. So the way we do this at Connecticut College is to connect a member of the career office who has expertise in health professions with a professor in the sciences. In this case, it's a professor of botany, and the two uh, work together as a team to provide pre health advising. They have a very active website for students. And they coordinate uh, EMT training opportunities and laboratory opportunities for students that are seeking uh, careers in the health professions. And what we found is that that synergy between the academic um, uh, individual and the career individual has been beautiful. It's really ended up allowing students to move very fluidly between the classroom and practical experiences that are building the resumes for health professions. One other angle of this that John could talk about is our science leaders program too, which I think is another great element of the college. Yes, just briefly, uh, we do have a, a really wonderful group of faculty in the sciences who for many years now have brought together a cohort of students, uh, mostly students who are underrepresented in the sciences. So women and students of color uh, to have a sort of cohort approach uh, to getting an early exposure uh, to the science courses at Khan. So um, it's a combination of, you know, getting some exposure to the coursework and also, uh, you know, having an opportunity to adjust to the social transition uh, or to make the social transition into the college as well. Underrepresentation is something that exists, as we know, in many fields. It can be most prominently experienced in the STEM field. So uh, this is our answer to that uh, disparity. And it's a program that has had really successful outcomes in terms of uh, rates of persistence and graduation in those fields. So thanks for highlighting that, Jessica. I mentioned, I mentioned earlier um, a student that had won a NSF graduate fellowship, right. and that actually was a student who was in our science leaders program. Yep. Good example. We did have a, a quick series of questions about study abroad, um, and I think that's an appropriate topic in this era. Um, so maybe we could touch base on study abroad. How many of our students typically go? Where do they go? And then we had a specific question about student athletes being able to take advantage of this opportunity. And then maybe a, a, a quick little nugget or tidbit about study abroad in the era of coronavirus slash COVID-19. 
So um, my office is the office that does oversee study away. And uh, we did mention already that um, a little bit more than 50% of our students are likely to do a study away experience. They usually do it in their junior year. And for the most part, it's a one semester experience, though in some cases it can be a full year. They go everywhere. Um, we've had students, you know, as far as uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Africa, um, in the Middle East, uh, South America, Cuba, um, really anywhere that the student dreams is, is possible and they can find an appropriate academic program. They'll bring back um, credits that will account for a full semester and that is, is easily done and integrated back into their uh, major and, and their other coursework. There are um, some that are direct enrollment programs where the students go directly to the university and in other cases, they work with a, a program provider like Butler or other uh, well-known and established programs. We have something called On Call, um, which is a emergency um, service that provides for all of our study away students. So if there were any medical or other kinds of um, natural disaster uh, situations that emerged, On Call will help our students and in fact, we have had situations where they've been able to uh, provide support to bring a student out of the country when it was necessary. So we're very, we feel very pleased with the on-call uh, support structure that we have in place for students that are on study away. Now, in this COVID era, we are really having to look very carefully at uh, what to do about study away. We did have to bring back our students from study away because programs were canceled or um, were uh, countries were moving into a, a high alert zone. And so we made decisions to bring students back. We were able to do that successfully with all of our students and also through our student emergency fund provide uh, additional funding to help families who had to bring students back at such short notice. So we were very pleased that we could do that for our, our students. One thing, though, in this era, I have to say is we've currently created a task force, which is meeting this summer to look at potential ways of revising or thinking about study away in a very different um, world health environment that we're in right now. It, this does make me think, though, if I could ask Victor to talk about um, the way that we actually have support for our students on campus as well about emergency uh, issues with the RAVE program. Could you just talk briefly about that, Victor? Uh, sure. So there's uh, Rave is um, is a uh, is the system that we use on campus for emergency notifications. So when we have emergency notifications or messages that need to go out to the campus, whether it's weather related or some other kind of an incident, we're able to communicate very quickly and easily to students, faculty, and staff um, about that. Um, and then through this this program, there's also an app called the Guardian app um, that we invite all students to uh, load onto their phone. And that provides them with very easy access to getting in touch with campus safety, with um, you know, New, London, New London police if they should want to do that. Um, it also has resources, a um, you know, variety of different pieces of information about how to respond to different kinds of you know, emergencies that might you know, you know, happen you know, on campus. Um, and then there's also this really you know, neat function that uh, provide students with the ability to do, a, you know, it's called like a safe walk, a walk across campus, or quite frankly, anywhere in the world with somebody virtually. Um, so your son or daughter might, you know, text you and say, you know, hey, I'm going to be walking across campus, and the text will come from the app, um, and then you'll be able to see on a map, you know, your child walking across campus, you know, with little kind of breadcrumbs going across the um, across the map. Um, and you'll be able to see when they've arrived to their location, you know, safely. Uh, and they can do that with friends. They can do that with, you know, family members, whomever, um, whomever they like. But it's really turned out to be a great resource, um, you know, for students to use and to, you know, help them feel safe. I mean, in general, this is a very safe campus. Um, you know, we're here, um, you know, on this hill. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of, you know, traffic from, you know, people coming and going, you know, out of campus unless they, need, you know, need to be here, you know, on campus. Um, it is a campus where we have campus safety officers regularly patrolling um, the campus. The main part of the campus has gates at all of the entrances. So 
at eight o'clock at night, you know, those gates close and everybody comes in and out through the main entrance and there's a gatehouse there and campus safety checks in with everybody that's coming and going from campus. Um, so it's a very safe place to be in general. Maybe we could talk for a couple seconds about New London and the relationship between the college in New London, um, how our students uh, leverage coffee shop and service learning opportunities and community service uh, down in New London. So who wants to tackle that? And for those folks who are concerned, I actually live right here in New London. I've lived here for five years. It's a wonderfully quaint little town with a bunch of really cool, funky, uh, independently owned coffee shops. It's great. And by the way, when I, when I first moved here, I was totally freaked out about the fact that I moved to a town with no Starbucks. And then I realized that you can actually get really good coffee somewhere other than Starbucks. It was an amazing learning experience for me. Shop local, Andy. That's good. I know. I'm learning. Um, I'll say a quick word. I think any of the three of us could comment. There are so many different ways to engage in New London. Uh, probably the most prominent resource we have on campus is the Holleran Center for Community Action, uh, which is a a sort of hybrid. It's an academic program. It's a center, as uh, Jefferson described, the academic interdisciplinary centers earlier. But it also has a really strong kind of community based learning approach, which obviously is very experiential. And there's a lot of opportunities for out of the classroom engagement in London. Um, they're probably our, our biggest um, and most visible resource for making connections to the community. Uh, we'd like to, first of all, I would say that the, uh, the approach to community based learning is one that really values and prioritizes the reciprocity of, of working alongside uh, neighbors. We don't see them as people who need the college to swoop in and rescue them in any, uh, in any sort of way. So when there are opportunities for engagement in the community, it's to work alongside our neighbors to figure out what the college can offer uh, and, and what the community can offer us uh, in terms of the, the engagement opportunities there. So that's something I think is really important to note philosophically. Um, outside of the Holleran Center, though, there are many other ways we have um, uh, students who are in the teacher education program who are working within the schools in New London and uh, as they are seeking certification as teachers in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we have people who are involved in local religious um, groups, you know, uh, community groups. So we have faith based uh, organizations for Muslim students, for Jewish students, for Christian students and other faith traditions. Um, who, uh, students are a part of congregations, so there's any number of ways. And then, of course, there are the coffee shops and the restaurants and the art galleries and, and small businesses in town that we like to frequent as well. So I think it's a really thriving small city and one uh, that's really actually quite rich in diversity and history. And uh, there's a lot there that I think our students could, uh, could learn about. Students also have, have easy access to, to New London and the neighboring town of Waterford, you know, through something called the Camel Van. Um, the Camel Van picks students up on campus and takes you to downtown New London, takes you to Walmart, Target, movie theaters, um, and, you know, other, and the, and the mall that's around, you know, around the corner from, from campus. So it's easy for students to get off campus um, to get what they might need, um, or just to get off campus for that matter. Uh, in um, if they don't have a car and sometimes we switch up the the route for the camel van, you know, particularly in the early part of the year, allowing students to go to take students to the beach um, and some of the other neighboring towns along the shoreline. And, and lastly, before we finish up, there have been a couple of questions about student athletes and the student athlete experience and support for them. Um, Victor, I think this falls right into your wheelhouse with athletics reporting up through you and, and uh, one, of the, one of the times when Victor and I can actually have a conversation in a meeting is when we see each other at sporting events when we can have some of our side meeting and conversations. So go ahead, Vic, tackle that. Yeah, we, have, we, do, we have a wonderful athletic um, you know, community. Uh, you know, obviously, we're part of the NESCAC. It is arguably the most competitive Division III um, conference in the country. You know, regularly um, sending, uh, you know, four or five uh, teams to the national championships. Um, so essentially, the way we see it, every NESCAC game um, throughout the season is essentially a national championship caliber, um, you know, game um, or match. So it's very competitive. Um, you know, we have phenomenal, phenomenal coaches um, who are deeply dedicated to the whole student experience, you know, what they're doing in their sport, 
as well as what they're doing in the classroom. You know, right now, you know, as we speak in this remote kind of environment, all of our coaches are talking, you know, calling one on one each of their, you know, athletes, um, you know, connecting with them on how things are going, providing them with support. Um, you know, they're still doing all kinds of really interesting team building um, initiatives, um, even in this kind of remote kind of an environment. If you um, are part of, you know, Facebook or Instagram and sign up or or like the uh, the athletics program, you'll see all kinds of great information about um, about the athletics program. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's 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 a wonderful part of our of our community, um, and we have a wonderful facility right across the street from the main part of the campus, overlooking the waterfront. Um, our facilities are essentially on this kind of terraced land um, that kind of leads down um, to the waterfront. Um, if you haven't been on campus, so it's it's really a phenomenal program, and you know all of us you know very regularly frequent all the athletic you know events. There's always something to do on a on a Friday or Saturday. Mm. Oh, I think I saw I saw a question kind of scroll through here about the NESCAC as it relates to the fall. And what I would say is that our AD, um, who's our new AD, um, Mo White, she just started this past year, who's also just phenomenal. If you get a chance to connect, you know, with her, I highly suggest it. Um, Mo is in regular contact with the other ADs. In fact, I think they ha they have a weekly meeting as well, um, and just met yesterday. And they're talking about a whole variety of different strategies um, to address athletics, uh, you know, through COVID. I think there was one other thing that 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 a few folks asked about, and and it, it's a natural question that some folks are going to ask in a setting like this, and that is uh, the financial circumstances that the college is currently navigating regarding, you know, coronavirus and COVID nineteen and some of the disruption that it has um, sort of presented. And at this point in time. I think it's in, you know, we're we're still crunching numbers for, <clears throat> you know, the impact of this on us. We we are hopeful in at this point in time forecast what we think will be a balanced budget for this year, for the fiscal year ending June 30th. Um, and right now we're running about 22,000 different scenarios for what next year could look like. But, you know, one of the great things about being at Con is we're we're a younger liberal arts college here in New England, we've always been a little grittier and we've always been a little bit more nimble and adaptive. I mean, there's, there's, there's a tremendous strength to a community that comes together and everyone's willing to wear tons of different hats and pitch in to make sure that the place not only provides the world-class education that it does, but it also survives into perpetuity. So I don't know if my fellow Thank deans have something else they wanna share there, but go ahead, Vic. Yeah, I think what, what I would add is that it gets back to the shared governance um, point that we talked about earlier. You know, this is the whole community coming together um, to problem solve and make plans, you know, for, for the future. Um, there are faculty, there are staff, there are students on these three working groups that I talked about earlier in the session. You know, yesterday we had a faculty staff uh, meeting with over 350 people in the WebEx, um, you know, participating in the um in the session participating in the q a um you know very engaged in you know thinking together about um about the way forward um which i think is very emblematic of who we are and the kind of place um you know that that, that this is i i guess what i'd like to add too is uh i'm embarrassed to say that this is my 32nd year at connecticut college <laughs> and uh, what I can tell you is I've seen many different periods in the school's history, and I've seen other challenges. And at every point in the course of those decades that I've been here, I've seen um, the alumni, the Camel community step up and be there for this school. And so in a way, I don't really worry because I know that there's such a long string of love and support for the college that we will get through it because of the devotion that people have to the institution. So um, I, I really welcome you to become camels because it's something that sticks with you for the rest of your life. And it's a very, very positive thing to be in the world. So I, I'm not worried for the institution in the long run. Well, it's 6.02 PM. I wanna thank everybody for showing up. I obviously wanna thank my colleagues, um, 
And some of the, the folks that I consider to be the most student-centered people I've ever been, had the honor and privilege of, of working with. Um, feel free to follow up with any of us. Our emails are available on our website. I know I shot a couple of uh, folks my email address for some follow-up questions, but we really appreciate you joining us tonight. And uh, best of luck. Hope everyone stays happy and healthy and safe through this coronavirus. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see you very soon on campus as future camels. Okay. Camels. Go camels. Thanks, everybody. Take care. All right.